before we write our first monetary policy, our first minting policy, let's briefly recall how validation worked that we have seen so far. So when we don't have a public key address, but a script address, and uh, UTXO that sits at such a script address, and a transaction that tries to consume that UTXO as an input, then for each such script input, the corresponding script is run, the validation script. And that validation script as input gets the datum, which comes from the UTXO, the redeemer, which comes from the input, and the context. And uh, here we can see the context again, and uh, it has two fields, the TX info field and the script purpose field. And we saw that for script purpose, everything we have seen until now always had the purpose spending TX outref, where TX outref is a reference to the UTXO we try to consume. And this TX info has all the context information about the transaction that is being validated. Now for monetary policies, for minting policies, this is triggered if the TX info mint field of the transaction contains a non-zero value. In all the examples we've seen so far, this was always zero, which means in the transactions we've seen so far, we never created or destroyed tokens. But if this is non-zero, so we have a value here, then this value, as we have seen just now, can contain a bag of asset classes, so different asset classes for different um, currency symbols and different token names. So if this is non-zero, then for each currency symbol contained in this value that is being forged, the corresponding minting policy script is run. So each currency symbol is the hash of a script, of a policy script, a minting policy script, and for each value that appears here, for each um, currency symbol that appears in this value in the forge field of the transaction, the corresponding script that belongs to the currency symbol is executed. And where the validation scripts had three inputs, the datum, the redeemer, and the context, these minting policy scripts only have two inputs, a redeemer and the context, no datum. That would make sense because datum sits at something that's being spent in uh, the output. And in this case, there is nothing like that. There's no place where the datum could possibly sit. So the transaction will provide the redeemer, as it also provides the redeemer for all script inputs. So for each currency symbol in this value with a non-zero amount, the corresponding minting policy script will be run with the redeemer and with the context. So the context will get as TX info the transaction that's being validated and as script purpose, it will get minting with the currency symbol that is currently checked. So whose minting or burning is currently checked. So to be precise, we look at all currency symbols that appear with a non-empty map in the TX info mint field. So all currency symbols where there is a token name, so does the corresponding amount to that currency symbol and the token name is not zero. And for each of those currency symbols, we run the corresponding policy every time with a different script purpose, namely minting that currency symbol. So there may be several different policies involved in one transaction if you mint currency of different currency symbols in this transaction, mint or burn. And for each of those currency symbols that are involved, the corresponding minting policy will be executed. And they all have to pass. If only one of them fails, the whole transaction will fail. So let's look at an example of a minting policy. And let's start with a very simple one, similar to what we did for validators. I created a module free and as for validators, we first define a Haskell function that represents the policy. 
and then we'll compile it to Pluto score. So a validator takes the datum, the redeemer, and the context. And as I explained, there is no datum for policy, so, so we just have redeemer and context. And for this simple one as redeemer, we can use just unit. And then script context as before, and again bool. So this is the typed version. So I mentioned before that there's low level Plutus, which just uses data or built in data for all arguments and then returns unit and failure is indicated by thrown an exception. But um, we won't bother with that here and immediately use the typed version. And normally I would need a two data instance for the type of the redeemer, but unit has one already. So the simple most policy we can write is the one that always returns true. So no matter the script context, we just return true. So this represents a minting policy that allows all sorts of minting and burning for the currency symbol given by this policy. Recall the currency symbol is the hash of the script. And in the same way as we have to convert the typed validator to an untyped version of a validator, we have to convert this typed minting policy to an untyped minting policy. And there's a helper function that I call wrap policy, also defined in utilities that does that. Incidentally, for validators, the corresponding function was just called wrap, but I changed that name when I added this one for the minting policy to make it clear which version is for which use case. So here we have now this wrap validator, which until now was called just wrap, and I added the wrap policy. It's, it's, it's very similar just a bit simpler because we have one fewer argument. We don't have the datum argument. So we can use that and apply it to our typed version of the minting policy. Then we have to compile it. So I called the corresponding policy free policy and we have a function from Plutus V1 ledger scripts called make minting policy that takes compiled code of the right type and converts it into a minting policy. And very similar to what we do for validator, again, we have to use template Haskell. So we have to compile our Haskell function to a Plutus script and then use this make minting policy script. And exactly the same is true what I said before. Normally, this wouldn't work because all the code has to be contained inside these Oxford brackets. But because of this inalienable pragma, it works like this, that I can define them outside of, of these Oxford brackets. And that's it. That's our first minting policy. I also defined two helper functions um, to serialize the resulting policy to the hard drive and to actually compute the currency symbol. That's another helper function I added. It's in this serialized model from the utilities. So there are now also versions for minting policies. So validators as before, but also policies. So we can try this. If we open the REPL for this module, we can do save free policy that should succeed and the result is here in this asset folder here. So this is the serialized version of this minting policy. We can also call free currency symbol and this gives us the currency symbol of this minting policy. Note that we don't look at token names at all, so they are completely arbitrary. So as long as we use this currency symbol, we can freely mint and burn tokens with this symbol, with arbitrary token names.
So if somebody offers you to buy tokens with this currency symbol, you shouldn't pay money for it because you can just mint it yourself in arbitrary quantities. Now let us try whether it works. So I chose to use the same approach that Thomas used in the last lecture. So I wrote a TypeScript script using the Lucid framework and then we can just execute it with Dino. So beginning just the imports and similar to Thomas, I also put both my wallet seed phrase and my block force key into a file secret.ts. And this is a helper function because I want to make the amount of tokens to be minted variable. So this is just a function that asks the user for an amount. This is the policy and that's copied from the file we created just now. This is the same as Thomas demonstrated. So I'm using the preprod network for this example. And the reason is just that my NAMI wallet is on preprod, the one I want to use where I have the seed phrase. You can just as well try this on preview. So I collect, connect my wallet with the seed phrase and I lock my own address. Then I need the policy ID and Lucid provides a utility for that called meeting policy to ID. So the policy I defined here, I can just apply this function to it and I lock the resulting policy. Now this unit thing that's Lucid's way to basically represent asset classes. And the way it works is it's just a concatenation of the currency symbol and the hexadecimal representation of the token name. So often token names are ASCII, so they are like human readable names. In my example here, PPP free, but they don't have to be. Token names are just byte strings. I think the length is restricted to 32 bytes, but it can in principle be arbitrary byte strings. But if it happens to be human readable, then wallets normally also displayed like that. But because it can be arbitrary byte strings, it's easier to work with a hexadecimal representation, which incidentally, for example, the Cardano CLI also does. So if you use token names in the Cardano CLI, it's also supposed to be hex encoded. So this from text helper function does that. And I read the amount from the reader and now I construct the transaction. So as before, I start a new transaction and now this is for minting, mint assets. And it contains first an object where the keys are the asset classes I want to mint and then the value is the amount. So this says of this asset class, I want to mint amount many tokens. And then I give the redeemer and data.void is just the unit redeemer. Recall in our example, we don't need any meaningful information in the redeemer. Then for the validation to work, the node of course needs access to the actual script, not just to the policy ID. The asset class only contains the policy ID or the currency symbol, which is the hash of the script. But same as for validators where the validating transaction needs to somehow include the actual script. If we do some minting in a transaction, the transaction needs to contain the actual minting policy. Similar as for validators where you can also use reference scripts, you could do the same here as well. But normally that doesn't make much sense because normally minting policies aren't used often. I mean, normally only once. Normally you only mint a token once. So it probably wouldn't make much sense to put it as a reference script on the blockchain, but you could. But if we don't, then so you have to attach it to the transaction with attach minting policy. And that's already all. So Lucid will take care of 
finding input in my wallet to pay for the transaction fees and it will also automatically put the minted amount back into my wallet and this is same as before so we have to sign the transaction and then submit it and I just lock the transaction ID the transaction hash in case everything went well so let's try this so with dino run minus a lucid free dot ts so my address has been locked and the minting policy has been locked now I can enter an amount so for example let's mint 1 million of these tokens and I get the transaction hash so it seems to have worked now we can check in the wallet whether the tokens get there and they have already arrived so they're here so we just minted native tokens and you can see that this token name is actually displayed here we can run it again and this time let's burn the tokens we just minted so i use minus one million as an amount the moments the token are still here so the transaction hasn't yet arrived on the blockchain so we must wait a bit and they are gone so i successfully burned them so we have seen the first example of a native token on cardano a very simple example an example with a minting policy where arbitrary minting and burning is allowed so those tokens obviously are not valuable because anybody can mint or burn them at will and we saw how to use lucid to write the off-chain code for this and actually mint or burn the tokens